Colleges and universities tend to bring together people of different backgrounds, faiths, and opinions because being exposed to multiple perspectives helps us become more creative and agile thinkers. Without racial, socioeconomic, religious, and ideological diversity, campuses have the potential to turn into an echo chamber where only the same voices, ideas, and arguments are heard. Though it may not seem like it at first, making an effort to talk and listen to those who you disagree with can have a lasting impact on your campus culture. For the record, we are not saying that college can't be a time to make friends with like-minded people. The freedom to associate with the group of your choice is essential to the democratic way of life, and it is clearly protected by the First Amendment. Without the right to join or leave groups voluntarily and to work with others towards a shared goal, important ideas would stop at the individual. But it's also important to look beyond these circles and develop the capacity to talk across differences. While you can certainly decide who hangs out in your dorm room, certain shared spaces like lounges and courtyards are designed to encourage us to step out of our comfort zone. Learning how to talk across differences will not only help you personally, shaping you into a more agile thinker, it will also help to strengthen the inclusive atmosphere and culture of open dialogue on campus, which relies on our ability to learn from each other. Put very simply, we limit ourselves when we only engage with similar worldviews. In this setting, we become less curious, more hostile to perceived differences, and less reflective about our own internal biases. Overall, this is not an ideal atmosphere for students of higher learning. To combat this problem, we can make a point of talking in good faith with people who don't share our worldview, asking each other how we arrived at our beliefs and about where we have doubts can be a perfectly respectful exercise in challenging our assumptions about one another and the world around us. This open-mindedness becomes especially important in the context of classrooms, where we rely on our classmates and professors to reach a fuller understanding of a particular topic. In contrast to high school, many college classrooms are not so much about getting the answer right as they are about testing out new ideas. There may also be occasions outside of the classroom where collaboration becomes extremely useful, if not necessary. Consider, for example, a case at the University of Rhode Island where the university's student senate refused to fund certain student groups because they believed, incorrectly, that funding political or religious groups would endanger the student senate's tax-exempt status. Beyond that incorrect belief, the policy had been applied selectively on the student senator's subjective interpretations of a group's mission. Five separate student groups who had been denied funding, including the campus chapters of the College Republicans and College Democrats, worked together to challenge the student council's discriminatory funding methods. And they succeeded. The group's ultimate success stemmed not just from the cogency of their arguments, but the power inherent to diverse coalitions. The group's shared concern that the policy was unconstitutional overshadowed other arguably more ingrained ideological differences. We hope this story encourages you to think about what we lose when we choose to let cultural, intellectual, or interpersonal differences prevent mutually beneficial collaboration. If a conversation outside of the classroom inspires high emotion, if it erupts into insults or personal attacks, you should know that it's okay to walk away. But when we resort to silencing and intimidating our fellow students, we erode the trust and respect necessary for the life of a college or university. Not all disagreements have to turn people into sworn enemies. Take, for example, the famously elusive friendship between liberal Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the late conservative justice Antonin Scalia. Sure, the two may have shared a love of opera, they may have both been raised in outer borough New York City, and they may have served together in the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit before working together in the Supreme Court. But to the extent to which they disagreed on matters of law and justice cannot be exaggerated. Whereas Scalia tended to insist on an originalist reading of the Constitution, 
Ginsburg believed the document was living, and its meaning needed to be adapted to the times. This philosophical distinction may sound overly technical, but for these two, it translated into radically opposed views of the law and how government should work. In non-unanimous cases, the two were on opposing sides 52% of the time. Scalia and Ginsburg's political disagreements were eclipsed by their shared sense of humor and unshakable mutual respect. While working together as judges, they were known to ask the other for feedback on their opinion writing. In other words, they turned their disagreements into opportunities for learning. We were both academics. I yeah, it was, it was about the Vermont Yankee case. Vermont and you were Yankee. inveighing against it. Terrible. And I was listening to him and yeah. disagreeing with a good part of what he said, but thought he said it in an absolutely captivating way. <laughs> I think we should leave it at that. <laughs> Great point. <laughs>